Thank you very much, Pippa, for a really wonderful talk. Um, I'm not a physicist. I'm obviously I'm a, I'm a biologist, actually. Um, and but one thing that really struck me is how much the search for the Higgs boson captured the public's imagination um, to a significant extent, really. I mean, there was journalists from all over the world kind of uh, queuing up to, mm. to report on it. Why, why do you think that that was the case? I, I don't remember a, a scientific event that caught the public's imagination to that level for a very long time. Yeah. I, it I think part of it was was we we were all so excited. We were also trying to explain what we were doing. What, why is why is why is this mysterious? Why is it exciting? Why do you want to know about this? When there was that seminar in July, I, I didn't queue up all night to get a seat. I um I actually though I was asked to sit in the room with the journalists. So that was and they were so interested. They really wanted to know, and they they were really pleased that, that I could kind of like. This is the good big mm -hmm. You know, this is you know you want to pay, pay attention now. You know, good plot coming up and so on. And they were really asking questions. Yeah, I think it it really did capture the imagination. Some of it, some of that is because CERN was also trying a bit harder actually to to reach out and say, look, you, you want to come and find out about this. This is good stuff. This it's not just you know something a bit private for people who like to do high energy physics. It's for everybody to be excited about. Yeah, I, th I think well, I think it's really amazing because in, in my job I come across lots of people who say, well, you're dumbing down about science all the time when I say actually you're communicating science properly to the right audience so but but this is something that's so quite complex and, and I was really really surprised that it, it caught the, the yeah, public's imagination yeah, especially some of the some of the I mean of course you can make the simplified version and then the slightly more complicated version which I tried to do today which is challenging <laughs> uh, and, and if you really want to do the maths it's yeah you have to do a degree in applied maths or particle physics or something the, the really the deep understanding and doing the calculations is is complicated mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean you can't get an idea of it absolutely, absolutely. right so we've got lots of time for questions so if you would like to ask a question please put your hands straight up and i will i can see one just straight up right there so let's go for that one first You talk about how the Higgs boson gives the other particles mass, and you talk about the Higgs boson having mass. So is yes. it giving itself mass, or are the Higgs bosons mass? Isn't is there a distinction between mass and energy at this level? So, so the magic word you have to fill into what you just asked me is field. So the, the field, and I'm supposed to call it the Brout Engler Higgs field, and actually I was brought up it, calling it the Higgs field, but that there was three or, or six or, or ten theorists involved in explaining why this, this new type of field could give mass to particles. And the field can kind of get tangled up in itself, so it can even spit out a particle of its own, if that helps you think about it. No, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's, it's because the field itself can have excitations. You can get little, little clumps of this weird field that, that are not just causing problems for the other particles, but actually the field somehow interacting with itself. No, that one, yeah, he's no. nodding this time. Yeah, there we go. Oh, upstairs. We've got uh, what, someone upstairs. Oh, way up. Yep. Hello. We can hardly see you because the lights are falling down on us. But uh, Thank you. Um, during the downtime, are there changes being made to the measurement apparatus? Are you trying to capture different data or just more of it? Um, OK, that's a good question. Um, better quality data. Yes, definitely. Each time we have one of these long shutdowns, we improve the detectors as well. So even during this long shutdown for, for the Atlas detector, We've been putting in an extra layer of those pixel detectors that measure the particles as they emerge from the interaction point. So we've, we've been able to put a smaller, a narrower beam pipe that has to go through the middle of the detector because we still need that vacuum so the beams can come through, which has given us enough space to put this new inner layer of pixels. So that will allow us to measure the point of origin of particles more precisely. Now, I explained why you need to be able to pick out different interactions, different proton-proton collisions. But there's another thing we can do, which is if, if a particle is made which doesn't decay straight away, it lives a short distance, you can actually measure that a few of the tracks are emerging from a what we call a displaced vertex. So um, that, that particles with bottom quarks in tend to live just, a sh just long enough that you can measure this displaced vertex. So for the Higgs boson, if we want to decay, if we want to measure Higgs decays, 
to BB bar pair, it's really important to be able to measure these finite lifetime particles. They decay still before they, usually before they've got to the first layer of the detector, but we, 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 we still want to be able to distinguish them. And then we've, we've made various repairs to power supplies and cooling systems and so on. And then in the future long shutdowns, again, there's a program for improving the measurement apparatus to be able to cope with the higher data rates and so on. Um, I'd like to ask um, how changing the different things you smash together affects what you can measure and what type of particles you can look for, because you mentioned how one of the detectors used lead nuclei and the one before the LHC used electron positrons and the LHC itself right. used hadrons, right. so how does that affect it? Okay. So before the LHC, you're right, we collided electrons and positrons together. And the advantage of doing that is that electrons and positrons have no substructure. So all of the energy from the electron and positron goes into the collision. It's a very clean kind of collision that you can measure. The problem is electrons and positrons are very, uh, have low mass compared to protons. So if you want to accelerate them to high energy, they start radiating a lot of x-rays. They lose a lot of energy each time they go around. So you can't go nearly as far up in energy with electrons and positrons, even though they're easier to understand the collisions. So that was one part of your question. Then why do we sometimes use protons and sometimes use lead ions? Um, so we choose to do collisions with lead ions from time to time for, for this. Do you remember I mentioned the quark gluon plasma? So if you want to create a droplet of stuff with hundreds of quarks and gluons really squished in together, you can't, you can't do that with just one proton and another proton banging together. If you use lead nuclei, you've got 208 protons and neutrons in one lead nucleus, 208 in the other. And if, you, if you're lucky and you smush them together head on, then all 208 from each nucleus can interact together and it's enough to make this new state of matter, this quark gluon plasma. Okay. Oh, sorry, and the, the other thing is, yeah, <laughs> you can make lots and lots of protons. It's fairly straightforward to get protons into the machine. It's much harder to get large numbers of lead ions. So we can only make a few, relatively few collisions with the lead ions. So we can't do the whole program with the, the lead ions. I see as experimentalists, you're already proposing experiments that could uh, investigate dark matter, but you're still left with a small percentage of the universe being accounted for even in that situation. Uh, you spotted that. Is there, uh, is there any prospect for experimentalists being able to investigate dark energy? At the moment, there are no theories to explain dark energy that actually make a testable prediction. So as, a, as an experimenter, you know, my job is knocking down theories. So the theory has to make a prediction that we can actually then go after. So that even, even though some of these uh, extra dimension type theories are really weird, they do at least make a testable prediction. And for the dark matter, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's being attacked from three different ways. We can try and make it, in, make dark matter in the LHC. But then there are experiments that are looking for dark matter particles coming in from outer space. So a, a, big, a big detector array looking for the effect of a, a, of a, a cosmic dark matter particle. And then the third thing you can do is look for evidence that dark matter particles are colliding in outer space and annihilating. So looking for the products of dark matter annihilations arriving at Earth. So it's kind of this three-pronged approach to try and really pin down what the dark matter is. Dark energy is much more difficult. We don't, we don't have, if, if there's no theory to test, it's hard to test it. There is um, a, a person oh, up there, yeah. I can see a hand. Um, hi, I was just wondering the difference between a field, an event, and a process. Is a field kind of a, a thing that is occurring constantly through time? Is that the main difference? Between a field and a... A process and event? Oh, um, yeah, so a, f a field is, is um, something that can spread through space. Um, and it's reasonably straightforward to think of like electric fields or something. It gets more complicated when you're talking about these kind of quantum fields. 
But then, then the events we observe, those are specific collisions that have happened where we can, I mean, almost take a picture of them. So the field is, is, a, is a possibility, a potential filling space, and, and the event is an actual measured collision. Okay, thank you. There's, um, there, was some more. there was the gentleman there in the brown jumper was first, and then suddenly there's a wave of hands over here. It's incredible. A field Hi, of hands. thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I was under the impression that there was a worrying lack of evidence for supersymmetry so far. So can you fill us in on where, where that's up to, please? Um, yeah, supersymmetry is kind of feeling a bit, a bit challenged at the moment. I mean, the first obvious flaw is it predicts twice as many particles and we haven't seen any. So they have to be more massive. And, and then if they're going to do this helpful trick of cancelling out the quantum fluctuations, they can't be too massive or it stops working. So the fact we haven't seen them yet at the LHC is uh, concerning, but not, not, it's, you know, it's, not, it's not written off yet. And then there are also other measurements. Um, for example, the LHCb experiment has measured the rate of a certain very rare kind of B decay, so a, a B sub S meson, which means a, a, a particle with a B quark and a strange quark, the rate that can decay to two muons. That rate is coming out um, just in line with the standard model prediction, whereas if, if there were supersymmetric contributions, it should be a higher rate. So yeah, it's getting pinned down. One thing that's very interesting is for, for this cancellation trick to work, um, it really has to mostly deal with the top quark. The top quark is the heaviest of the quarks, so you have to cancel out the effects of the top quark. So maybe you don't need all the supersymmetric particles to be light, you just need the, the, the third family, the, 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 the stop quark and the bottom quarks. You need, you need the partners of the top quark and the bottom quark to be light. So we do have searches where we really home in on supersymmetric processes with lots of third family particles to really try and constrain the top uh, supersymmetric quark. Okay, um, so... Oh, we're getting more yes, and more. Yes, we are. It's like, it's come alive. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, you said that you create a lot more collisions than you can record. Yes. How do you decide which ones to keep? And, you know, to record. Yeah, and, and how do you know you're getting the right... losing maybe something of interest. Right. So we have a, um, a system that says that's an interesting event, read it out. For example, a significant energy deposit, or has there been a high energy muon, or is, is there a lot of missing energy? So that's done, first of all, with, with very high speed electronics. It has to be done in hardware. And then we have enough time to read out maybe 20,000 events and actually put them through a, a first processing. But you have to be absolutely sure you're getting that right. Because if you get that wrong, you've thrown away your Higgses and kept some boring stuff, which would be, you know, really annoying. And so as the, as the collider was gradually ramping up the luminosity. This was exactly the exercise we had to do. To start with, we just recorded everything we possibly could. We call that minimum bias, the least bias possible. Just be sure there's an event that's happened. And then we start running those algorithms, those selection algorithms, and say, which events would you have kept? Check it's keeping the right ones. And then you can start to trust some of the algorithms. Okay, this one's working now. We can put in the jet counting algorithm or whatever. And you gradually bootstrap up. And when we restart next year in 2015, we'll have to do that again. Be absolutely sure everything's working. Another, another thing that's really important, the, the detectors are huge. So the particles from this collision are still making their way out through the detector when the next one happens. So the other thing you've got to do is make sure you've got everything synchronized, that you've timed in all the different parts of the detector. And again, when we, when, we start, when we start up, we'll have to make sure we've got this timing correct, that we're picking out the right events. And there was a question, yes, the gentleman in the, in the white shirt, just there. Uh, you talked about increasing the resolution of the um, detection elements, um, the energy. What about the magnetic field and why magnetic field that you use to induce curl, curl in the, the lesser energy collisions? Could you increase the uh, magnetic field or other fields to deal with higher energy collisions to discern between those? Um, we, the magnets that we've built into the experiments are at the limit of the technology we could achieve when we were building them. 
and if we were going to replace the magnets, we'd have to replace everything. So it's not, it's not viable to do that. Even if we actually knew how to make better magnets, we, we, we just couldn't totally rebuild the entire detectors. Now, the other thing with the magnets that's interesting is you need the magnets to bend the beams. So what about if you wanted to go to higher energy collisions? So instead of going, well, why high luminosity LHC? Why not go for high energy LHC? And there is research and development going on for that as well. Because um, we maybe know how to make magnets that are twice as strong. So then in the same tunnel, you could maybe double the collision energy, which is also interesting. But to go, in, to go really beyond that, you have to go to a, a future circular collider. There are, there are even thoughts, you know, what would be the next step? You'd need, you'd need a tunnel that was 80 or 100 kilometers long. You know, there have been like geological surveys done to see, is, is it even plausible to be able to drill a tunnel that long in the Geneva area? What, can you go onto the lake? You, how do we miss this mountain? No, it's, I'm serious. So you, there is a sort of survey that's been done that has a sort of plausible path for a... 100 kilometer long accelerator. Why do some people think that the, super, that the collider could create black holes? Um, there, there were some people who really loved scaremongering. <laughs> and they kind of cherry picked the theory, right? They said, oh, you've got this theory of extra dimensions that says you can make black holes. Isn't that really, really dangerous? Now, the theory of extra dimensions says you can make a microscopic black hole and it will decay instantly inside the detector and, and it'll make a sort of spray of safe particles that come out. And there's, there's absolutely no way in the theory you could make a dangerous black hole. And then they said, oh, yes, but you don't know all the theories. What if... And so they would, I mean, they were out to make trouble, but we wouldn't have started the machine if we weren't sure it was safe. So, so we took the other approach. Okay, suppose we've no idea of this theory. How do we know that we're not going to make something dangerous? Uh, but there have been cosmic rays hitting the Earth from outer space since the Earth was created. The Earth's still here. Those cosmic rays are much more energetic, actually, than what we can do in the LHC. The thing is, in the LHC, we can do it always in the same place, so we can put the detector there to measure it. So cosmic rays have been hitting the Earth and the planets and the sun, you know, and it's all still there. So from that, you can be very confident that we can't accidentally create something dangerous in the LHC, because it's going on all the time anyway, and we're still here. I think also one, another thing from, I observed from being involved in public engagement was that your scientists weren't ignoring those things or just locking themselves away. You were out there talking mm -hmm. to the public, talking to the journalists right. to make sure that the correct explanations were out there in the media. Yeah, but it was, it was more than just talking to the public because there, there was actually a group that was formed of eminent theorists mm -hmm. and so on who actually went away and did the calculation. You know, what, what, what would happen if a cosmic ray hit a neutron star? You know, re really explored it. I mean, of course, you give... You, 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 you're not going to give a whole 14-page report in an answer in a public seminar, but there was a lot of work that went in to really understand what, what are the rates, what are the probabilities. Thank you very much, Pip. I'm really sorry for that. There were a few people that I didn't manage to, to, to get to answer their questions. I'm very sorry about that. We've got to finish, but I'd just like to ask you to join me in thanking Pippa for a really wonderful talk. And thank you.